good because I've got a decrease. You go with Jesus now. You and Jesus, you're on your own. Okay, you're in better hands now with him than with me. So go, get close to him, draw near to him. And uh, I couldn't help but think about last night when Louis was talking about the, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus being there, you know, as a, as a dad of, of five children, I pictured my oldest daughter and I thought, what would I feel if she's looking at me and going, Dad, is there any other way? Like, like if, in the words of Jesus where he says, my soul is grieved to the point of death. Where Jesus is going, I already feel like I'm dying right now. This is killing me. I am sorrowful to the point of death. And then to go to his dad and go, Daddy, is there any other way? Is there, is there any other way? I mean, to the point where he's sweating drops of blood and I try to picture my daughter looking at me and going, Dad, is there any other way to where she's dripping blood from the intensity and saying, I already feel like I'm gonna die right now. Is there any other way? And to do it three times, Three times to come to me and go, Dad, is there any other way? And I just tried to think as a dad, how could I look at that? But then for Jesus to say, but, but not, not my will, but your will. Not my will, but your will. If there's any other way, please take this cup from me. You know, as, he's, as he's sweating drops of blood, please take it from me, but not, not my will, your will be done. And then to hear that it was the will of the Lord to crush him. And all night I'm just going, God, are you kidding me? You went through that for me. I can't. Help me thank you, help me thank you, Lord, because I, I don't think I can do justice. I don't want to just say thank you for the cross. Help me, God, help me thank you with every bit that's in me. That's all I want to do is thank him, thank him, thank him, praise him, praise him, praise him, and I don't want us to leave the cross. I don't want us to move on from the cross. I just want to drop you off there. That's all we want to do. All, everyone that's going to be on the stage, we're saying, you know what, we're just telling you, go with Jesus. Oh, you're leaving us and going, good, 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 because we've got to become less and less and less. Your parents need to become less and less and less, and your, your youth pastor needs to become less and less and less, and everyone is trying to drive you to the feet of Jesus so you could just commune with him, thank him by yourself, enjoy him, love him, get to know him. Man, forget about us, get close to him. That's what this is all about. It's a good day, it's a good day. So this afternoon, <clears throat> I'm going to Africa. Um, yeah, pretty exciting. Anyone want to go with me? All right, let's go. I, but you know what? One of the coolest things about this trip, I'm going with maybe the most intriguing guy in my life right now. This guy is so interesting to me. He's like that guy on that beer commercial, the most interesting man in the world. He, he ran a marketing firm, he was running a marketing firm, big deal, you know, but in his spare time, he would go to the Middle East, he would go to Africa, and he would set up these feeding programs for those who were starving to death. He'd figure out ways to dig wells and get clean water to them. He would build medical clinics out, this is all in his free time. He would hire evangelists out there just to go and spread the gospel. He, he, would, he would rescue trafficked children. He would go to the red light districts in some of these towns where it just seemed like the, the women just felt trapped, like there's no other way to make a living other than being in this little tiny shed and having guy after guy come into my room for dollar, two dollars, you know. And, and, and he'd go to these girls, share the good news of Jesus, see them fall in love with Jesus, but then educate them. And some of them have become nurses, some have become, you know, teachers. But the coolest thing was I saw pictures of him 
walking these girls up the aisle on their wedding day. And I thought, oh, I want to do that. You know, is there anything cooler you could do in your life than to lead someone like that out of that lifestyle, introduce them to Jesus and have them fall in love with someone you walk them down that aisle and give them away on their wedding day. I just go, Lord, I, I, this guy is so cool to me. And you know, so I'm just intrigued by this guy and I, I just, one, one day he, he told me one of his secrets. He says, you know, I wake up every day and I think, this is gonna be the best day of my life. He says, and you know what? It usually is. And I thought, what? Every day? That just sounds exhausting, <laughs> doesn't it? I mean, I get it if we did it today, because it's passion. It's gonna be the best day of my life. But really, you're gonna do that tomorrow too? You know, next Wednesday? Because I, I, I just thought in my mind after he told me that, I thought, I like having like a few throwaway days in between, you know, and go, okay, next Saturday is going to be amazing. You know, and sometimes even throw away years where you go, oh, when I graduate, when I get into that position, when I get married, that's going to be the greatest year. No, when I have my kid, that's going to be the greatest year. But why not believe that we have a God that could make every day better than the last? Why not believe that today, like this next worship set, could that be the greatest worship in your life? See, you have control over that. You could say, okay, this next time we sing, God, I want to be more passionate than I've ever been to say, God, the next time I pray, I want it to be the most intimate you and I have ever been. To say, even right now, okay, when Francis reads from the Word of God, okay, when he's done with all his stories and he actually opens the Word, you know, can you make it so that I just get it, like I get your Word like never before. Make it the best, the best, the best. And to keep on increasing in all of these areas. Do you believe that? Are you even striving for that? You know, I, uh, there's so many things in our lives we can't control. But the things that make your life the best, those are under your control. You know that? See, you, you can't control your money. God could take it away any second. You can't control your job, your position. God could end that, whatever. People can end it. You can't control your relationships. You can't control other people and what they're gonna do to you and whether they're gonna love you for the rest of your life or not. You can't control that. But the things that make your life great are under your control. See, you can decide. You could decide, you know what? This year, I am gonna be the purest I've ever been. God, I want you to put to death sins in my life, and I, I, according to the word, I can do that. You can decide and say, God, I want to be so close to you this year. I'm gonna seek you with all of my heart. And to go after those things. I, I love what Peter says in 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter one, verse one. It says, Simon Peter, a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I love that phrase. He's assigned Peter, servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those, that's you, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. Peter says to me, Francis, you have a faith of equal standing with me. See, we've got, please, get it out of your heads that somehow you are inferior to someone else in your faith with God. Okay, don't, don't come to passion and go, oh man, Louie must have this, really, you know, Piper must be here, you know, here's Christine, you know, and, and, and then here's me. Because what Peter immediately is saying is, look, you've got a faith of equal standing with the apostle Peter. Equal standing, that's the word of God. 
You've got a faith of equal standing. I hear all the time when I talk about God or I talk about you know, living by faith or this time I had with Jesus, people have literally looked at me and said, well, that's easy for you, you're Francis Chan. What does that even mean? Like we do that, we go, well, that's him, that's her, and I'm going, but that's not scripture. Peter says you've been given an, an equal faith. You're on equal standing with me. In fact, in the next verse, it, you know, after he says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, look what he says in verse three. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. His divine, so God's divine power has given you everything you need when it comes to life and godliness. Do you believe that? So you're in equal standing with Peter and God himself by his power, he just gave you everything. Everything you need as it pertains to life and godliness. Now it doesn't mean we don't have limitations in some areas. Like I could study all day long, you know, but my mind, I don't, I don't know that I'll ever know as much as Piper. I'm not saying my mind is there. I got limitations. There are, there are gonna be, he's not saying that. He's not talking about intellect. Just like Chris Tomlin. Chris Tomlin could, could shoot baskets all day long, all year long, get a private coach and just practice. Shoot, 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 dribble, do this, do this. And he'll never beat me. It's, it's limits. <laughs> We have limitations. We have physical limitations. We have intellectual limitations. But what the scripture is saying, he says, all things that pertain to life and godliness. I will never be the best athlete in this room. I can't. I, I just, I'm limited compared to some of you. But there's no reason why I can't be the one that's most alive. You know, and there's no reason why I cannot be the godliest person in this room. And there's no reason why you, see, you've been given everything. This is scripture. Don't believe the lies that everyone else tells you that you're somehow inferior. No, this is up to you. You've been given it all by his divine power. God says, here it is. I'm granting it to you. Everything you need. You can have the purest mind. Did you know that? You could have the purest mind. Your thought life could be the purest one because he's given you everything you need for that. You have the ability to have the purest mind, your thoughts, to make a covenant with your eyes and say, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, purify me. I want that. Make this the purest year of my life. Can help me to receive more life from you than ever before. Because he says, it's through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. He didn't call us to mediocrity. Do you understand that? He didn't call you just to survive and to try not to sin too much. He called you to his own glory and excellence. That's what he saved you for. Oh God, I want all of that life. I want all of that godliness. I want your spirit just to flow through me. Powerful, powerful words. Then he says, and then it gets even better. Verse four, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Are you kidding me? Not only that, he says you can actually partake you become partakers. It's not just like if Francis is here and God's gonna help me out being beside me. No, he says, read my promises sometime. What did I tell you? My spirit would actually enter into you. Okay, so now you're not even just walking alongside of me, but you're an actual partaker of the divine nature. Amazing. These promises are for you. you. You ever read like the Old Testament and some of those miracles? And you ever, you ever read some of those Old Testament miracles and go, 
God, could I just see one of those? Right? You ever do that? You read the Old Testament and go, God, all I need is one of those. Okay, just, just one. I don't care. Name it. Fire from heaven. That'd be cool. Have someone thrown in a pit of fire. Let me just see him not burn. You know, what? whatever. Any of those. It doesn't even have to be me in the pit. I just want to watch someone. You know? <laughs> It's just, God, can I see one of those? Or, or do you ever go, or you ever look in the New Testament, and you read about Jesus and go, gosh, could I just see one? I just want to see one. I just want to see him, the water one. Okay, walking on water. Can I just see it? Can I see it? And I've done this. Where I'm reading scripture, I'm going, God, I just need one. Let me see one of those. But I realized when I long for the Old Testament miracles and when I long to see something Jesus did, then I have a faulty understanding or experience of the Holy Spirit. If I'm longing for the Old Testament, if I'm longing for Jesus, then I don't understand the Holy Spirit. Because everyone back then was, man, I can't wait for the future. I can't wait for this period of time. We talked about this last year. For those who were here, remember Ezekiel's vision? You know, in Ezekiel in chapter 36, you've got to understand, they were all envying us. They were envying this day when God was going to put his spirit inside of us. We'd be partakers of the divine nature. They're going, are you kidding me? I mean, I get the holy of holies. Man, no one goes in there. You're telling me that much power is going to enter into people? I want a piece of that. You, you read about it in, in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel uh, 36, where he says in, in verse 26, I'll give you a new heart, a new spirit I will put within you. I'll remove your heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. God says, I'm gonna do a new thing, a new thing. I'm gonna do something new. Okay, you know how you can't obey the commands right now? Wait till you see what happens in the future. I'm actually gonna put my spirit, yeah, my spirit, into people. And it's to get them to the point where they'll actually have the power to walk in my commands. They're gonna, they're gonna actually become a slave to righteousness. Okay, that's what the Holy Spirit's gonna do into them. And then you see this, this, this vision and then in, in the next chapter where uh, he, he's put in this valley of dry bones in chapter 37 and, and in verse seven he says, I prophesied there was a sound and a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone and I looked and no way, there were sinews on them and flesh came upon them, skin had covered them. You know, it's like he's in this valley of bones and suddenly these bones start rattling and coming together. He goes, this is what it's gonna be like. People are gonna go, this is nuts. God just put these people together. He just put their spirit, his spirit in them. You know, I, I have, um, I brought some uh, chicken bones and I don't know if you can see that, but just this pile of chicken, and I don't know, I can't see the screen. Are you focusing on my chicken bones? Are they, are you, can you see my bones on the screen? Okay, seriously, you guys, you guys. <laughs> Watch what happens, just stare at it. Watch what's about to happen. All right, just had to give it a shot, but imagine. <laughs> Imagine, seriously, okay, what if, what if right now we're looking and suddenly you saw these bones rattling and start coming together? Okay? And then what if, you know, the, the, ins, the things, the liver and stuff start growing and then flesh grew on it and then feathers grew on it? And then suddenly this thing jumps off of the stage and just, ah, ah, you know, just starts going. I mean, just try to imagine what you would do. You'd go, best passion ever. You know, this, that was insane. You would walk away going, you'll never believe it. Francis bought a five piece meal, you know, took all the meat off. It turned into a chicken. 
right? You would never be the same again. And the Bible says that's what people should see when they see you. When they go, what happened to you? How did you do this? That was the miracle that's supposed to take place in us. So then we're not longing for these Old Testament miracles. We're not wishing I could have walked with Jesus. He says, it's going to be to your advantage. And so somehow I've got to believe this. And I was praying, God, could you get a new generation to believe in this miracle? That they are partakers of the divine nature. That they will stop idolizing speakers and pastors. Yes, learn from them, grow from them. But they're just here to drop you off at the feet of Jesus. To say, make you a partaker of the divine nature. And go, man, the power that's in you, I want to release you. I want everyone to see this chicken. You know, I want to see everyone. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this open just to leave room, just in case. Um, <laughs> you guys right here, watch it and tell us if anything happens. But that's, that's what's supposed to be. Man, has that happened in your life? Some of you last night, do you understand, when you understood the cross for the first time, and you said, you know what, Jesus, I want you. I want you, I want that. I'll give everything up for that. I, I, I just found this treasure. You can have everything. I finally have eyes to see, give me that. The Bible says, now you trust in those promises. It's through those promises that you become a partaker of this divine nature. And then I love what he says next. having escaped from the corruption that's in the world because of sinful desire. And he says this in verse five, five. For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, your virtue with knowledge, your knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. But I want you to pay attention to what he says. Verse five, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Do you understand those words, make every effort? See, this is not a passive, because some of you guys are going, I see what you're saying, I guess it didn't work on me. I think the Holy Spirit entered me, but it didn't work, because I'm still not holy. I still don't know that much, I'm still not that, the Bible says this is not some passive act. Yes, God does this, he makes you a partaker, he puts you on equal standing with Peter, but then he says in the very next verse, he goes, so now you make every effort. Okay, you do something, you don't just sit there and go, hey God, make me holy. No, he says, no, you make every effort, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Supplement, are, are, have you been doing that? Have you been making every effort going, God, I wanna be this virtuous. The virtue, it, 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 it's, it's, the word's interesting, it's almost like an appropriate, um, like an appropriateness, like a, like a godliness, I guess, I guess it's the word we would use for godly, like, okay, someone who has faith should have these results. Like these glasses should help me to see. Um, this table should hold up this Bible. Um, that's what tables do. Um, this, these, this key should fit in that lock. Um, this Christian should be godly. You understand that? Like, it's the natural outcome, this moral excellence. We as believers should be morally excellent because the spirit of God is in us like Ezekiel promised. He's gonna put him in us and we're gonna be able to obey his commands. So someone with the spirit in him is gonna have this power. And he says, so, but you've gotta make every effort at it. I've gotta strive for this. Holy Spirit, that's in me. You've been giving me everything that pertains to life and godliness. So guess what? I'm gonna use that and I'm gonna make every effort to be the godliest man or woman. I'm going after it. And he goes, and then add, add to that. Um, make every effort to add to your, your virtue knowledge. Add to your virtue knowledge. Make every effort towards knowledge. Okay? It, you don't just naturally know all the things. People go, well, I don't know the Bible that well. And I go, have you made every effort to do that? 
Seriously, are you a student of the word of God? I understand some of us don't have the same mental capacities as other people. Some of you are beyond me, some of you are below, it doesn't matter. The issue is, are you making every effort to pursue this knowledge? Look, I hate, I hate reading. I can't, I, I just don't like it. Yes, thank you, okay, me and him hate reading. Man, we just hang out all day. We'd rather play video games, we'd rather go surf. We, but reading, I just, I don't enjoy it. I'd rather snuggle with a cat, and I hate cats. You know, it's just, <laughs> I, I just don't enjoy, it's not natural, but I go, you know what, Lord? Your word says I should be making every effort to add to my moral excellence this knowledge of you. And I wanna know you, so I'm gonna study this word, and I'm gonna force myself, and I'm gonna read this over and over. Man, I, I'm gonna commit to reading through your word every year. Do you know it only takes 10 minutes a day and you can read through the Bible in a year? You don't even need that. They've got these apps now that read it for you. You push a button and it takes 12 minutes. 12 minutes a day and you can, uh, you can listen to the Bible. As you're driving, just going, you know what God, okay, maybe I have a, I have a hard time reading, I'm gonna listen, I'm gonna listen. And, uh, and then you just push play, I'm not gonna do it right now. But you know, it's just, you just go, God, I wanna know you and that's why I'm getting into your word right now. Even 10 minutes a day and you get through the whole book which, which probably some of you have never done in your whole life. And the Bible says, make every effort to know me. Make every effort to add to that moral excellence. Yes, you're a godly person. Yes, you know, you're, 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 the, morally, the morals are there. And I'm saying, you need to know me. Really know me. Understand more about me. Know my character. Know what I love. Know what I hate. Make every effort towards that. And then he says, add to your knowledge self-control. This is key. This is such a big one for all of us. He says, make every effort to add to your knowledge self-control. I have heard so many people blame the Holy Spirit for their lack of effort. Where they go, well, I asked God to take away my desire for marijuana. I told him and he didn't. I told him, I go, God, take away this lust for women. And he didn't. I asked God to take away these un, you know, improper sexual desires, and he didn't take it away. And what does the scripture say? It says, make every effort towards self-control. What is self-control? It's when you want to do something and you don't do it. And there are times when it's gonna take every bit of energy in you where you just wanna scream at someone. And it takes everything in you to just hold back. And go, I'm not gonna yell, I'm gonna love her. Oh gosh, I wanna say it. Just let me say it. It's gonna take every ounce of effort not to push send, right? or to look at this website, it's like, ah. Oh. He says, make every effort towards that. Yes, there are times, there are times when a different miracle happens where you pray that God takes away, I've heard of this. People who have been addicted to, I've, I have friends like this, they were addicted for years. On crack for 20 years, prayed that God would take it away, boom, they said it was weird. It's like I woke up and it was gone. But that's the exception. There's others who just have to make every effort, every effort, and you fight and you fight and you fight and you go, look, I know I have power over this. God promised me he would not let me be tempted beyond what I can handle. There's a way of escape and I'm gonna take that route. I'm gonna make every effort and I'm getting out of this one. That's what self-control is all about. And he says, add to that self-control perseverance. Perseverance because there are days when we all wanna give up, okay? You're not alone. We all want to quit. There are days when your temptation is so strong, you go, God, would you just take me home? I don't want to fail you. I'd rather you just kill me right now because I don't know if I'm going to make it through the day without sinning against you. And he says, make every effort toward that perseverance. You have it in you. I've given you everything you need for life and godliness. I gave it to Peter. I'm giving it to you. You're a partaker of the divine nature. This can happen. Make every effort 
Don't give up. Don't give up. Make it through another day. He says, add to your steadfastness, godliness. Godliness is worship. Godliness is this idea of bowing down. What I was doing last night, what I did this morning, it takes effort to worship him all through the day, doesn't it? I was thinking about this passage. I've been meditating on this passage the last two weeks, and it's weird because it's so dumb, but sometimes it takes every ounce of effort in me just to turn off the radio. You ever find that, like you wanna worship, but then a song comes on, you're like, I kinda wanna listen to that one. You know, I gotta confess, ah, never mind. Um, yeah, why not? Um, my, <laughs> I've got four daughters, and one of them got, like a year ago, um, this Taylor Swift CD. It's really embarrassing, but she put it in my car, and I started to like it. And you know, pretty soon she's like, Dad, when am I gonna get that CD back? I'm like, never, ever, ever. Uh, <laughs> okay, just give me an example of confession. You know, and so even me, I'm on, and so sometimes it's just hard to turn it off, you know, and go, gosh, well, this is so dumb. Here I am, a pastor, a speaker, and I don't wanna push that button to worship. It takes effort to block, like, like Louis said, we are the most distracted people ever. And to just say, no, I'm not gonna think about anything else when I go to bed tonight. I'm not turning on that TV, I'm not jumping on that computer, I'm just gonna worship him because I want to make every effort to be this godly person. I wanna add this godliness to me. I wanna be a person of worship and that means taking away some of these distractions. You know, there's a do not disturb button on this. I'm pushing that. I, I just don't want any noise, I don't want any people. I want to be a man of worship all throughout the day, godly. It takes effort though. It takes effort. You can't just say, oh, I'm just not one of those people that worships all the time. You're not making the effort. He goes on adding to that. He goes, add to that brotherly affection. Brotherly affection. People are going to irritate you to death, right? People in your own ministry are going to irritate you to death. Youth pastors, your students are going to drive you crazy. <laughs> Your students, your leaders will drive you crazy. You're gonna bother one another, you're gonna do this. And he says, would you guys make every effort towards this brotherly affection, you guys? We need this so badly. I understand there's gonna be theological differences in this room, and I'm gonna disagree with you on some of the finer points of theology, but I gotta be able to pursue this brotherly affection for you. Okay, some of you may believe differently on some of these issues in this book. Does that really excuse you from loving me dearly like a brother? Or if anything were to happen to me, you're like, no, don't let that happen to him. That's my brother up there. Make every effort towards that. Make every effort towards love. Add to this. This is work, love. Isn't this who you want to be? Don't you want to be at the end of your life, oh God, I just want to be the, the most loving, you know, you know, towards unbelievers, towards the poor, towards people who hate me, towards my enemies. I just want to be so loving. I want to have this brotherly affection. I want to be pure. I want to be steadfast. I want to have self-control. I want to have so much knowledge of you, and I can have it all. And then I love how he says uh, in uh, one of the verses, Eight, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If these, qual if these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful. I love that. God guarantees you, if you just work on these character issues, you won't be ineffective. See, so often we do it backwards, right? I mean, we all wanna do great things for the Lord, don't we? Don't you just wanna go, God, I, I, I just listened to the Burnettes, are you kidding me? They, they own TV for your glory. And you go, I wanna do that. 
I want to do that. Well, how do you do that? According to the Bible, don't just pursue that. He goes, if you pursue these qualities and you increase in them every year, I promise you, you will not be unfruitful or ineffective. See, sometimes we do it all backwards. You go, I want to do this, I want to do this. No, why don't you work on being this and I promise you, you'll do some amazing things. God promised, because some of you are sitting here, you're going, man, this is my fifth year of college, I haven't even declared a major, I don't know what my plan is, I don't know what God's calling me to, and I'm telling you, yeah, you do, brotherly affection, love, self-control, perseverance, godliness, virtue, knowledge, pursue these things, you won't waste your life, none of us want to waste our life. Not after reading Piper's book. We don't want to waste our lives. We go, God, I, I want to do something. I don't want to just sit here. I don't want to just grow old and, and collect seashells. I don't want to do that, right? I want to do something while I'm here. And God says, okay, start with you. Start with your character. You've got everything you need. Now go after it. You be, be the godliest person in this room. You get the most, be the most intimate with Jesus. There's no reason. Nothing's stopping you. You're a partaker of the divine nature. My favorite part of this verse now, finally got, or passage. Verse seven, verse nine. Whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind. I love that phrase. Whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind. And having forgotten he was cleansed from his former sins, he goes, if you lack this, he goes, you're so nearsighted, you're blind. I love that phrase. The idea of being, you know what nearsighted is. You can only see the things that are right in front of your face. Like I wouldn't be able to see you. All I could see is my, my, my hands. He goes, some people are so nearsighted. All they can see is what's right in front of them at that moment. They forget all of these things I just talked about. Like, like, like if I dropped my phone right now. Like some of you dropped your iPhone and the, you crack the screen, you're, this whole weekend is ruined for you, right? It's going, oh man, it's, it's 22 months before my next upgrade. Uh, why didn't I get insurance? And suddenly all you're doing is staring at this one thing. Never mind that you have faith on equal standing with Peter. Forget that you're a partaker of the divine nature. Forget that God's given you everything you need for, for life and godliness. Forget that one day you're going to stand before God completely pure because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Forget that one day we're going to be together with him, just no more death, no more sickness, and just security like forever and ever and ever, inheriting the riches of his kingdom, the one who died for us because you cracked your screen. And you're so nearsighted, going, oh, but you don't understand. I had a chance to buy the protective case last week. <laughs> and no one's going to get through to you. Why? Because you're so nearsighted, you're blind. And you miss out on all of these things. And I've seen this in so many people. You're going to get so nearsighted. You guys, we're not going to live that long. Okay? Some of us won't be here next year. It's any second for us. Don't get so nearsighted that you lose sight of these spiritual realities. That's why 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, Our light and momentary troubles. I know it doesn't feel like light and momentary to you. Some of your pain right now, it's so real. You just think, it's like Jesus. Going, is there any other way? And, and, and yet what God says, your light and momentary troubles. They're achieving for you this eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. So he says, so we don't look to the things that we can see. 